I created the concept of this Venn diagram while I was figuring out how labor can get done in our economy, in a new economy that comes beyond capitalism. And that is for every human being to live where I thrive, doing what they want to do, what they can do, and are aware needs doing. Turns out the intersection of my disability and illnesses is that I have to live within this Venn diagram. I have to live where I thrive because it costs me the least amount of spoons. Doing absolutely anything outside of this Venn costs me hundreds or thousands of dollars worth of energy. If I have to do the dishes, if I have to clean my house, if I have to make a meal, if I have to make a phone call, if I have to drive somebody somewhere, all of those things cost me hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Whereas for someone else to do them, it would cost maybe a couple dollars, upwards of 20, but I'm still not entitled to their. How much of your day is spent doing things that you don't want to do? I want you to imagine that every time you have to do absolutely anything that you don't want to do, somebody goes into your bank account and pulls out $100. Don't want to go to work? Don't want to work for the five every five minutes that you're at work? You're not making a wage. You are losing money. How would you cope? You can't force yourself to do things you don't want to do because every time it's going to cost you a minimum of $100. Don't want to brush your teeth, 100 bucks. Don't want to get in the shower, 100 bucks. Some of the tasks can be done by other people, but generally in our economy, you'd have to pay them. And how can you pay them when you can't earn money unless you're doing something you love and getting paid well for it? How would you accommodate your own needs if you couldn't do anything you didn't want without it costing you greatly? In that original video, I'm not saying I'm worth $1,000 an hour. I'm saying to do anything outside of that Venn diagram, anything outside of the very center, costs me the equivalent of $1,000 in energy. Somebody else coming and doing my dishes, especially if they wanted to and can do it already, wouldn't cost them $1,000. It would cost them a couple bucks, 10 bucks of energy, but I'm not entitled to it because it's my dishes that need to get done, right? Just because it would cost somebody way less to do them than it would cost me doesn't mean I can make somebody come and do my dishes. But I need somebody to do my dishes so that I can unleash my genius into the world. And so I am frustrated society doesn't see our shared value when spoonies are resourced, when disabled people are accommodated, we're gonna do amazing things. I'm already doing amazing things even when I have to do my dishes. I put out the call for help on Facebook only to realize I'm not currently capable of accepting the level of help that is offered. I need an entire team of people to hand off stress to in both my personal life and my projects. I don't know how I'm going to get that, but I was clearly waiting on this next step to, for that purpose to realize I can't accept it at this level, so what else is there? I have known that the next thing I need to do is ask for help in my personal life. I've known this for months, but asking for it and knowing it are two totally different things. Um, so yesterday I posted just after midnight on my Facebook page everything I need help with and a little bit of why I need help with it. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. We'll see what the universe gives now that I have followed the next step. That being said, I'm already getting advice that's like, just simplify your life. My life is simplified as it could possibly get. I do not need advice. I need help. Those are two very different things. There's a reason I said my life is complex and your advice isn't going to help. But by all means, simplify my life. I just watched a TikTok of somebody that I follow, and they were talking about how they have a lived experience expertise that their family doesn't go to. They are getting that information out of books instead of going to them for their lived expertise. I feel ya. I'm a scientist. I know science, yet somehow my family goes to my woo-woo sister 
for nutritional and science information. I've known how to dismantle capitalism and have been talking about it for near a decade. Now I have my siblings literally parodying back to me things that are like, have you thought about this? No, I've only been talking about it for a decade, by all means. There was a time where it felt like if my family didn't believe and trust in me, nobody would. And now I see it the opposite. They're going to be the last people to see me. They've known me since I was a child. They know me when I went through my brain tumors, when I got my university degree, when like every time I've said I'm going to do something and then done it. They know my personality and it's weird to have people know you so much, know that you own what you know and don't know, and yet not even be curious when you say you know how to save the world. Like it's just, it's so weird. And then to see watch somebody else in the same family say they're going to do something and time and time again not do it, but because they have bravado and like uber positivity, they get believed despite evidence, like actual evidence to the contrary. It's weird. Family member that has become more and more conservative, but also becoming less and less conservative over the last couple of years. It's been a really strange phenomenon. She is best friends with one of the founders of PragerU. That person is best friends with Candace Owen. This person has privately adopted, i.e. human trafficked, their child looking to s adopt a second one through private adoption. This morning, I got a message that they're deleting their Facebook account because somebody called Ivanka Trump out for her silence over Roe v. Wade when she, when her friends are not being silent, that they brought her in for an abortion when she was in high school. Giving Ivanka Trump's private medical information is the hill she's willing to die on. That's the entire thing around Roe v. Wade. Privacy. Ivanka Trump is the least of my concerns. Uh, no. Forcing people to give birth is discrimination and is hatred. It's racist, it's ableist, it's classist, and it leads to actual death. To reduce the amount of trauma on this planet, every baby born should know they were wanted. Not forced to be given birth to by a mother who might hate them or be indifferent to them. If you can't choose it, you're not going to love them. There are plenty of narcissistic parents out there right now while we've had access to abortion. When you start forcing people to give birth, society falls apart. A healthy person has a thousand wishes. A sick person, only one. I heard this quote for the first time today, even though it was 1968 and it was translated from German. That might be true for acute illness. When you get a flu, that might be all you can think about. But when you get long-term illness, including terminally ill long-term illness, there comes a time it does not consume your whole life and all of the other wishes come back. You just have to do them while you're also sick. You have to find a way to work toward them from within your capacity. But don't let the ables define you because that is how they will define you. You've been diminished to one wish and one wish only. And if you're not wishing for health, you're not doing your job, according to them. I just canceled my Meals on Wheels after two weeks. My meal got here today, and like a good two-thirds of them, it is not edible. And I'm not that picky of an eater. It reminds me of hospital food. It is not nutritious. It is not delicious. And it is any time between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., which when you don't know what time your food's coming, do you eat breakfast first? Because if I know it's getting here at 11, I'll skip breakfast. But then if it's not here till 1, that's not going to work out. It's a lot of packaging, not very good food, and expensive for $8. And what really sucks is before 2020, I was involved in an intentional community where 
All of the adults that participated cooked and cleaned once a cycle, roughly once a month, and we all showed up and eat, ate dinner three times a week. We didn't have to wash the dishes unless it was our turn. We didn't have to grocery shop and cook, and the meals were $5. Children's meals were half-priced, and that wasn't subsidized. They didn't have me pay less because I'm poor and disabled. That was mutual aid. That was us coming together and co-creating food so it was better for all of us. This was the way I was going to nourish my body so I knew I was at least getting one meal a day that I could count on. And instead, it had me eating less because I had a, basically a TV dinner sitting in the fridge that I'd paid eight bucks for. And I can't eat anything until I eat that. And I can't eat that because it's inedible. There have to be better solutions out there better options that are for everyone so it brings the cost down and so it isn't beggars can't be choosers instead it's let's nourish all of us and bring down the cost let's make sure everybody has food regardless of their ability to cook it or their ability to pay for it i know we can do it because we did it in an intentional community with 40 households with hundreds of households across the city, sharing in the labor, sharing in the food cost, we can make delicious food that is cheap, or than Meals on Wheels, and available to everybody. Now I get to go more in the one option I was really counting on. My kid was away sleeping at camp all week, having a great time. I... We've had this camp plan for months and months. She was supposed to go with one of her friends, but one of her friends couldn't go because they ended up going to Europe to visit family instead. The person was whose kid went to Europe was going to drive me there and drive me back. When their kid was no longer going to camp, I was like, well, there is a bus. There's a bus from, you know, East Van over to where the ferry leaves. I can catch that. She assured me she wanted to drive us. Monday, picked us up, drove us there. It was great. I then had a week to recuperate as much as I possibly can because I'm not getting interrupted by a nine-year-old constantly. My nervous system got a chance to calm down. I reconfirmed on Monday when she dropped me off. Hey, noon on Friday. See you then for pickup. I get a message early Friday morning that plans have changed because her husband's working. He always works Monday to Friday full time. And she has the kids. I was like, yeah, you can bring the kids. We can drive with the kids. She was like, no, no, but I can drop off the car. The very reason you're driving me is because I can't drive. I have a car. I can't drive my car. I definitely can't drive someone else's. Then it turns out the reason she can't drive me is her kid has gymnastics till 1 p.m. Which means either this is regularly scheduled every Friday or regularly scheduled. It's a day camp. So the person with a husband and an entire support of an entire community of support, other adults to step in and help take your kid to events and or look after them at home, cancels on me after she wanted to drive me. She went from doing something nice and sweet to costing me all of the energy that I have saved up because I had to spend five hours going to collect my kid on the bus in a heat wave when I hadn't planned for it. Now I'm dealing with both recovering from those five hours on the bus and even worse, recovering from a loss of friendship that I thought I could count on and realizing how fundamentally unfair it is that the people who understand disability can't help and those with the capacity to help do not understand. So canceling is no big deal to them when it costs me and my kid everything for the week. So I'm so happy your kid got to go to gymnastics. I have a question about family loyalty. That is, in your family, what does loyalty mean? Does it mean that each person is supposed to be loyal to the family's reputation? And therefore, if you're pointing out issues in your family, you're going to be the problem.
Is it loyalty to specific members of the family, those in charge, independent of age, where everyone is supposed to be loyal to them? They're usually a narcissist. Or does it mean this family will be loyal to you? No matter what you do, what you go through, you're going to be family and we're going to be here for each other. That last one is the only family loyalty that I can get behind. I never thought TikTok drama would lead to me and my daughter having no extended family. Because an influencer here on this app ran a smear campaign. And my sister, who has a lot in common with that influencer, let's say, um, wanted to fall for it. So uh, let's roll tape. They will be forced to make a call to child services. And with Jubilee, they told me that they were literally going to call, they had to call child protective services if I made a full-blown police report. And it scares the shit out of me. And I've been carrying that on my shoulders for a long time now. So can you please fucking listen, Jubilee? This is Jubilee's moment. You either choose me and your hate and your obsession, or you choose your child at this moment. That's not a joke. This is Carrie Ann. So it's fascinating to me that everything you say about another person is really about you, right? So Allie is self-diagnosed, whatever, autism. You're self-diagnosed autism. She's posting photos of your, your mom, and you're saying that while you've posted a photo next to her mom. I'm a narcissist when you're the one who for 10 years all you're focused on, like everyone in the universe should go to a universe of Jubilee, like a university. Everyone needs to be educated in Jubilee. Everyone needs to speak Jubilee. But you don't give a fuck about the stress you're putting your mother and your father under right now, your daughter. Forget about me. I'm not sleeping. But I'm trying to understand. I watched this particular influencer result in multiple psych evaluations for multiple people, have CPS threatened and called on multiple people. It's not effective unless it's your uh, rich blonde sister, right? Who's neighbors with Rachel McAdams, the original Regina George, mean girl in. I'm Jubilee. I've had brain tumors that my sister was here for the whole time. I have a little trouble speaking, but I am absolutely focused on saving humanity and the planet from the time I could speak. She was obsessed with self and are getting our family and anyone in her life to help her in her endeavors. This influencer may have cost me my family, but it was a gift. She gave me the gift of seeing who my family, especially my sister, already always was. Never on my corner, never heard me, never seen me. Well, that one lives at home with her parents paying her rent, giving her food, no child to look after, using their internet to bully, harm, and stalk people with all of her following to help. Life is what it is. And um, I will be exploring 2023 that was quite the endeavor for me and the entire world on where long-form content sits. Not harmed or bullied or stalked or abused amw that entire video is proof of you bullying and harassing and harming amw saying you're not going to sue for slander but that you could sue for slander implies you have proof you then go on to talk about what you're going to do is go after cyber stalking and bullying heavily implying that it was amw who was cyber stalking you. You keep making implied accusations that you're going to get the proof and it's gonna prove that the people you think of are doing this or doing this. The chances that it's them and not one of their followers or some other bot is so small and shows more that you do not understand how parasocial relationships work. You then go on to talk about academia and social media accounts implying that they're not in integrity with their employer social media guidelines. They've done nothing out of integrity or that would be against anyone's social media guidelines 
unless it's don't be on social media. You then go on to say that you know that they're dangerous because they made a video talking about something that you've added your opinion to and then decided is fact without stitching it, without showcasing that we might be able to see it and see what you're talking about. You keep using language like, I don't want to do this, but you're making me do this. That is abusive language. Please take agency over your own choices and actions. I am becoming deeply worried that you are not in touch with reality and your social media followers are making it way worse for you. This whole thing is sure showcasing that we do need community involvement and a way to step in when we believe somebody is out of touch with reality. When the algorithm is fed by them being out of touch with reality and the drama that stirs up. We, society, are in a collective mental health crisis and we're going back and forth at each other, attacking people instead of creating solutions that can actually work. Because we know what we currently have in mental health isn't working. Social media is not helping and is making it worse. And this last week has been a showcase for me in how toxic this can be. My sister participated in a series of cards known as bench warmers out of all of the ironic names. Uh, my sister also blew up my family October 7th, 2023 after a lifetime of toxic positivity and her sister being disabled and her not being able to handle it. So much so, she destroyed our sisterhood over many, many years while I tried to explain what it is to live with a disability. And she, well, just ableist all over it. Realizing from one of our last exchanges, she's like, ableism? Ableist is a label? No, actually, it's not. It's a descriptor. And it describes you perfectly. Now, <laughs> I, um, so her hometown, not Vancouver, Edmonton. Uh, does have her birthday, so not doxing. Good, good, good. Um, ambitions to own to have her own TV show. Things she loves: springtime, Tony Robbins, enthusiastic, warm people, anyone with an opinion, but only if it's positive and enthusiastic and warm and doesn't disagree with her in any way. They could be deceived. It could be perceived of as toxic or sorry, as negative, which she sees up as toxic. Thing she hates, couch potatoes, but she wants to have her own TV show. So she hates her biggest fans, right? Um, drugs, you might want to look at your past there, sweetie. And negativity, yeah. Aerial photography and surfing, I also call BS on. Photography, yes. Aerial, I bet you she tried each of those things one time. This is from February 6, 2001, from my sister. It's very long. I'm not reading all of it. Oh, there's another awesome book called Mind Power. I want to get it for everyone I know, especially dad. It talks about how your thoughts directly create your reality. If you don't like your life, it's because you made it that way. If you say there's no jobs out there, I'll never meet anyone. I can't make that much money then that will be your reality. It's all created by those little thoughts and the way we see ourselves. If you want to change your reality, start by changing those thoughts. You tell yourself every day. It's like learning a new language or your times tables. You got to imprint it in your mind over and over until it's in your subconscious, available to you without thinking about it. So go ahead, Jube, create your life. Paint it with whatever colors you want. Choose your colors carefully, and it will be beautiful. January 14th, 2004. This card says it best. You are more than my sister. You're my best friend and the one I can always turn to. You are such an amazing blessing. I hope this year brings you great things, money, love, and many miracles. 
miss you, your big sis, Tirza. So those ones are pre-brain tumor. This card is for my brain tumor, because I can't imagine what else it's for. It's not dated, but it would have been May 2005. So today is the day. I know how you are feeling. It's funny. I want to protect you and take all your fears away. But I know what the end result feels like, and it's truly life-changing. I wish you the best. You are my angel, my proof that there are still good people out there, people who will make an impact through their courage and strength. I may be hard on you sometimes, but it's only because I love you. I see your spirit. Since you were little, I watched you in awe. Your big, beautiful heart always open. You're never wanted anything in return. Your big, beautiful heart always open. You never wanted anything in return. When I would fight with mom, you would always comfort me. Now I wish I could do the same, but I can't take away the fear. I can pray to keep you safe, and I will. Your love inspires me. Love you, Tirza. Um, then a uh, book from my, well, my Eric made it. <laughs> my family and one other friend signed it. Here is what my sister wrote in here. Again, this is the day of my brain surgery. I'm not yet disabled, but I was just diagnosed with brain tumors after being toxically positive with her right alongside her in my diary for so long. This is the day of, right, right after I've had it, like, sorry, the day after, right? Like visiting me in the hospital after brain surgery. I am so grateful to have you all better. Remember, love and gratitude are healing. Love, Tirza. Okay, now. Uh, okay, so it's not your birthday, but it's over a year now since those things are gone. I don't call them things. <laughs> That's her toxicness. Um, makes me count my blessings, you being one of the most profound blessings in my life, my amazing best friend, so many shared memories between us, you keep me real, remind me of my roots, and always tell me the way it is. I love and admire who you are as a woman, your heart, your mind, your spirit, with which you live life. To me, a part of you will always be Annie Banani my nickname my mother gave me as a child. And yet I watch this woman unfold beside me that every day is a gift, that they go by so fast and it hits me. It's been a year since I've squeezed you, seen you smile, held your hand, and yet you're always with me in my heart. You're a piece of me like a limb. Ha ha ha. Friends who don't have a sister ask me what it's like. So funny. How can you ever describe that one? For this life, you will be my only sister. And that means the world to me. Always in my heart, Jube. Love your sister. So this would have been um, roughly May 2006. And this is January 14th, 2011. So still not a parent yet. Uh, still my sister being toxically positive about my disability, but uh, wishing you an new beginnings. May this year bring you a fresh new start as the beautiful lotus flower grows from the mud. May you blossom even more into the beautiful woman you are. Muddy past behind you. Now it's time to bloom. My sister blew up my family because she doesn't know how to listen in any way, shape, or form. Doesn't know how to hear. I've changed since brain tumors. I have less energy, less ability to pour myself into that one. And then I became a parent. She says that I'm selfish. Uh, I think I think all the notes from all of my family uh, showcase the exact effing opposite. The issue is when I became a parent, their focus, they stopped being the focus from the peacekeeper who was also disabled from being the peacekeeper.
being the one who keeps it together. Um, yeah. Tirsa, Tirsa, Tirsa. <sighs> Toxic positivity. This need to think positive thoughts, especially putting them on me long before I had brain tumors, when I was a positive person. I love how my pack ratness is, is now is is now paying off. I'm gonna Yo, imagine being a parent whose adult children cut all ties to you. They don't even speak to you anymore. They don't call you on your birthday. They don't plan anything for Mother's or Father's Day. They never even update you on your grandchildren's milestones, refuse to come to your bedside when you're chronically ill, never visit you in the nursing home. I mean, if they saw you in line at a Starbucks, they'd probably side-eye you for a minute and then pretend like they didn't even know you, all because you failed so fantastically, so monumentally at your job, your one job as the loving, supportive president in their lives that your children would rather dethrone you from quite arguably one of the most irreplaceable positions you could ever hold in another human being's life, voluntarily orphaning themselves, then spend one more millisecond of their time on Betty White's green earth, drowning themselves in your emotional immaturity. Couldn't be me. I am thinking we can just write up the following and replace every history textbook with it, like just on every page, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. Europeans ran out of their own resources because they disconnected their own relationship with the earth and that the earth is supposed to last all the generations, not just whatever generation you're on. So we overused our resources, had horrific parenting, and then we decided to spread that across the globe. Every page just Europeans used all their resources, had horrible parenting and spread it across the globe. Our job is not to paint our ancestors in a good light and prove that they were good people. Our job is to learn from their mistakes and make sure our descendants are good people. Week just for yourself so we can celebrate it. My answer is everything and nothing. Absolutely everything I do needs to be something that I want to do. Something that gives more to me than it takes away. But living from that place is living from my peak. Is getting the best gifts that I have to offer to the world, out into the world. Nothing I do is for a single other person. Now, it is for me. It is for what I see possible in the world. I don't know quite how to explain it, but getting to play your piece of the universe's greater design is the best gift there is. So it's all for me, and it's all for everyone. <laughs>